Welcome to the Professional Diploma in Web Development. If you've always had a keen interest in full-stack web development, then you've come to the right place. This course has been designed for both beginners as well as experienced web developers who seek a practical approach to web development. In this course, we learn all the fundamentals of web development and learn to code from scratch. We'll begin by installing and exploring our scripting environment, after which we'll move on to programming languages of the web. Now, this includes HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and even PHP. We'll cover both front-end and back-end technology stacks. Throughout the course, we'll develop a bunch of interactive web applications that you can add to your profile to strengthen your credibility as a full-stack web developer. From responsive e-commerce applications, style booking systems, and even HR systems, rest assured that this will be a hands-on course. As a bonus, you will also learn all about SQL databases and how to integrate them into your website. So stay tuned for all of this and more. Now, first of all, a warm welcome from all of us here at Shaw Academy, where we are here to help you learn the skills you need to succeed today. Wonderful. I'd like to take a second to introduce myself. My name is Rushen Weingard and I'm your web development educator for this course. My goal as your educator is to ensure that by the end of this course, you can officially call yourself a full stack web developer. Now a bit about myself, in terms of my education, I've obtained a BCom general degree at the University of Western Cape. I've also obtained my information systems honors degree at the University of Western Cape. And likewise, I've completed my masters in information systems as well. Recently, I've also obtained a postgraduate diploma in immersive technologies, where I've studied software development in augmented reality as well as virtual reality. And just so by the way, here is one of my favorite quotes. If you are going to try, go all the way. There is no other feeling like that. You will be alone with the gods and the nights will flame with fire. You will ride life with perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is by Charles Bukowski. Now, one of the biggest reasons I enjoy this quote so much is because it reminds me that you should never give up. And if you have a goal in sight and it's worth obtaining, you constantly have to push to succeed at obtaining that goal. Now, before we dive into the actual content, keep in mind that this course consists of four modules. Your first module is going to be very basic. Your second module is an intermediate model, which will become slightly more complex. Then we'll move on to module three, which is advanced, and finally wrap things up with our proficient module, module four. And by the end of this course, you will receive your professional diploma in web development. With that being said, let's have a look at the module outline for module one. So in our first lesson today, we are going to be focusing on the introduction to the web. In lesson two, we'll move on to introduction to HTML. We will start with our coding. Then we'll move on to HTML elements, after which we'll cover HTML attributes. And in lesson five, we'll have a focus on HTML inputs. Once we've wrapped up everything HTML, in lesson six, we'll start with an introduction to CSS. Then we'll move on to more advanced CSS topics in lesson seven. And then finally, probably the most exciting part of this module is that you'll have an HTML and CSS project by the end of this module. Excellent. Now that we have all of that out of the way, let's dive right into the content. So this is your first lesson, lesson one in the professional diploma in web development. And in today's lesson, it's simply going to be an introduction to the web. With that being said, let's go ahead and have a look at the objectives for today's lesson. So for our first topic, we'll be covering the internet and the world wide web. Also, I want you to take note that in the event that you'd like to skip ahead to some of the core topics, I've included the timestamps here for you so you can produce them accordingly. Next, we'll move on to networking basics. And this is going to be quite important moving forward because it ties in directly with our next topic, which is web server basics. And this is extremely important when it comes to web development. And here we'll focus on on the two tier and three tier architecture mostly. And then lastly, we'll have a look at the markup languages available to us in web development. And this includes HTML as well as CSS. Now, before you get started with the content, here is a quick did you know fun fact. The average user forms an opinion of a website in just 0.9 seconds. And that is pretty insane if you think about it. And it's also quite important because in the web development process, you have to make sure your website is appealing, the user interface and the user experience is almost seamless if you want to make sure that you are retaining users on your website. Lovely stuff. Now for our very first topic for today, the internet and the world wide web. So without further ado, let's dive in. 
Now let's briefly visit the overview of the internet. And essentially the internet consists of multiple computers or otherwise known as devices over a network that communicate with one another using a specific set of rules. And briefly or shortly, we will be covering the different kinds of architectures and topologies when it comes to networking. Now, the internet also originated from this program called ARPANET, which was initially a defense program by the US government. So back then, the internet was never available for public use until today. Now, when the internet did become publicly available, there were certain things that were now possible that we know today. And this includes various activities such as emailing, news groups, browsing the internet or perusing the internet for articles, YouTube videos and so on, including things such as e-commerce where we are now able to transact online and purchase goods and services. Apart from this, individuals are now also able to write blogs, whether it's from a personal perspective or from a corporate perspective. And then lastly, cloud computing came about, which is an extremely powerful tool used for personal use and for organizational uses. Another modern technology as the result of the internet is the internet of things and essentially the internet of things is a subset of the internet that includes computers and sensors and devices that are able to communicate with one another without the need for human intervention. And one of the most powerful things behind IoT or the internet of things is the fact that it results in automation. Now let's have a look at some of the characteristics of IoT or the Internet of Things. And essentially, as we mentioned before, it includes autonomous devices that essentially connect to one another without human intervention. And often you'll find that it is quite software driven. Apart from this, it also includes various sensors and scanners. And this could be temperature sensors, it could be cameras, it could be infrared sensors. It really all depends on the kind of data that you're trying to retrieve and what your intention is with that data. Also, we would tend to use IoT in either offices or home spaces and even outdoors like on farms, for example. The idea again here is it all boils down to what information you want to retrieve or what data you want to retrieve. Okay. And then lastly, as we mentioned before, it requires little to no human intervention because everything is autonomous and software driven. Wonderful. Now that we have a somewhat basic understanding of the internet, let's move over to our very next topic, which is networking. And here we'll cover the basics as well as some intermediate concepts. Now, our very first topic under networking is packet switch networks. And essentially, in a packet switch network, files are broken down into small pieces or chunks, if you will. And these packets are labeled electronically with the origin, sequences, and destination address over a network. Hence the name, packet switch network. And each packet can take different paths along a network until it is sent from the sender and it arrives at the receiver or the destination of that particular packet. And generally speaking, when we talk about labeled electronically, we refer to the fact that each packet is labeled with an IP address from the sender as well as the receiver. Let's assume we have Steve and Jane who work for company X. Steve on the one hand is an IT project manager while Jane is the project sponsor or stakeholder. Throughout the day they are in constant communication. Now the moment Jane actually sends an email over the internet, this gets decrypted and broken down into several packages before it ends up by Steve who then gets that email. And this is essentially how a packet switch network works. Now we've been talking about networks for a while and essentially there are two common type of networks that you essentially need to focus on and this is a local area network otherwise known as a LAN as well as a wide area network also known as a WAN. Now let's dive a little deeper to explore the differences between the two. Let's begin by exploring a local area network, otherwise known as a LAN. And essentially with this kind of network, devices are usually located close together. And this is ideal for situations where you have an office setup or a home setup, or even a network within a building or on a particular floor in a building. LANs are also quite popular when it comes to gaming tournaments, for example. And one of the biggest differences between WANs and LANs or local area networks and wide area networks is that a LAN is restricted by a geographical location, meaning that it can't necessarily span a huge area. Next up, we have a WAN or a wide area network. And a wide area network essentially connects multiple LANs, as seen in the architecture here. What we have is multiple LANs or three LANs being connected by one massive WAN. And a WAN or a wide area network extends beyond the boundaries of an office space, for example. A WAN or wide area network can connect multiple buildings over various distances and locations. 
And this is ideal for enterprise scale networks. So an organization that needs a wide area network, it would be ideal for organizations that are massive and scalable and that exist in various locations around the world to opt for a WAN instead of a LAN. And then this brings us to our last point. So like we said before, a WAN extends to a larger geographical area and this could include things such as the globe. Now, I want you to pause the video over here and just think of an example of a WAN. Have you given it some thought? Well, the perfect example is that the internet itself is an example of a WAN. And why is this? Because there is no geographical restriction on the internet. Now, apart from LANs and WANs, a network can also be public or private. In a public network, a computer or device is available to the public over a network. And again, a typical example here could be something like the internet, for example. Now, the issue with a public network is that it is often much less secure than a private network, but also cheaper to implement. Okay, if you think about it, no one really owns the internet, so you don't necessarily pay much to use the internet other than your data costs. All right? And then we have private networks. A private network is a connection between two companies which connects a network together. And typically you would use a private network within an organization to encrypt data to make sure that there is no sort of intrusion from the public into your data, okay? Now a private network can also be quite expensive because it needs to be custom built with your infrastructure such as your hardware and then adding your software stack makes it even more expensive. But the, one of the best things about a private network, one of the biggest benefits is that it is a lot more secure compared to a public network, which is what makes it ideal for organizations that manage sensitive data. So apart from using a private network, which we establish is quite complex and quite expensive to customize, we can also use virtual private networks. And this is essentially a connection that uses a public network, but encrypts the data over that public network. So essentially a VPN or a virtual private network acts like a public network with the benefits of a private network. And one of the biggest, one of the biggest benefits here is that VPNs are a lot less expensive to implement as opposed to a private network. With all that being said, there are some advantages of using a VPN and let's have a look at some of them. The first one is that you use software to encrypt the data over a public network and this is quite important and this is why it's so inexpensive because you don't have to invest in all the expensive infrastructure and hardware that comes along with a private network. Apart from this, you would also use IP tunneling and IP tunneling essentially creates a private pathway over the public internet. So if you think about it, a VPN is essentially the use of IP tunneling. Okay, and like we mentioned before, it's a lot less expensive than a private network and a lot more secure than just using a public network without a VPN. And then lastly, a VPN allows you to hide all your activity over the public internet. And this includes from your internet service provider. So a lot of people tend to use VPNs for this exact reason, to remain anonymous. And apart from this, VPNs can actually be used to change your location, well, sort of, if you think about it, so that you can use Netflix, so that you can actually access content that would otherwise not be available in your region. Just a tip in case you were wondering. So let's move on to intranets and extranets. As network technologies became less expensive and easy to deploy because of software as well as infrastructural changes, organizations started building more and more interconnected networks for special purposes, whether it was for internal stakeholders as well as for external stakeholders. Now, let's have a look at intranets first of all. An intranet is essentially a network that does not extend beyond the boundaries of an organization, meaning only the organization that runs that particular network, this includes the software, the infrastructure, all of those things that is strictly customized, built and managed by the organization in which it is deployed. Apart from this, forums within organizations use internets to foster new ideas. So the idea is that you can collaborate on these type of networks and maintain all your information and data and all of these things within your organization, as well as coming up with new ideas and innovative products and services. On the other hand, we have extranets, and extranets is pretty much similar to an intranet, but also extends beyond the boundaries of an organization. And a typical example includes using an extranet for business partners, customers, and suppliers, especially in the case of suppliers. So let's make an example. Um, in the event that a retail store 
uh, has its own supply or several suppliers, what they can do is they can extend the internet to external stakeholders such as suppliers so that suppliers can sort of monitor if supplies or inventory is running low and all of those kind of things. So the idea here is that you grant special permission to certain stakeholders based on the organization's needs. And that brings us to the closing of this topic, networking. Now, if you do want to learn a little more about networking, here at Shaw Academy, we do offer a course in cybersecurity, and this course is quite extensive in covering some of the fundamental and basics and some very complex topics in networking. So, if networking or cybersecurity is your thing, I do suggest you give it a try. And now for very, very important topic, web server basics. And I'm saying this is important because this is something every single web developer must understand. And in this section, we are most importantly going to be covering the web and client architecture. Now, let's start off by defining what a web server is. And essentially, a web server is a computer that hosts web content or files that make up the structure of a website. So essentially, these files include things such as images that actually get uh, placed on your website, a style sheet known as a CSS um, script, as well as a JavaScript file, perhaps, and including, and probably the most important one, your HTML documents. So on your server sits all of these files and your machine makes a request to this file to get from the server to sort of build the website in your client. And we'll discuss this in more detail shortly. But essentially, a server responds to client requests by transferring files and scripts to the web client, which is the browser like your Google Chrome, your Firefox, from the web server. And then by doing this, you generate the response by invoking scripts and sometimes querying a database. Now, yes, that can seem like a mouthful. So let's have a look at an architecture to grasp a better understanding. Now, let's start off by visiting the two-tier client architecture. And just bear with me for a second, because I know this diagram can seem slightly intimidating, but really, I'll explain everything in a second. So, like we mentioned before, we have a web client. And a web client tends to be the device that you, as the user, interface with. The client, specifically, is the browser. And this can be Edge, it can be Chrome, it can be Firefox, for example. Okay, and the client makes a request, an HTTP request over the internet. That request then gets passed over the internet, like mentioned before, to the server, okay, which hosts all the scripts and all the files that you need or that you want to render onto the client. When we say render, we are referring to the fact that it displays the buttons, uh, the nav bar, the background, the, the basically the entire website, okay? The server then responds if those scripts do exist and if the request is successful, the server responds via HTTP request over the internet and sends that back to the client. And then all of the beautiful buttons and the animations and the JavaScript file, all of those things get passed back to the web client where it is displayed on the screen or the device. Does that make sense? Now, let's have a look at a slightly more complicated architecture. Now, what we have here is the three-tier architecture, and pretty much the exact same thing happens. The web client makes a request over the internet to the web server, and the only thing you'll notice that's different here is that it is a catalog database in our architecture, as well as a payment processing system. And the reason for this is that sometimes on your server, you would have a database or some sort of system embedded in your server where you would want to fetch additional data, especially when it comes to databases. Databases are extremely powerful when it comes to web development. And then after all that data and all the elements or all the scripts have successfully been requested, it then gets sent back to the client where it's rendered out on the screen. Because keep in mind, only the browser, only the client can understand the code. We as human beings, we can't read the code and make sense of it all. Therefore, we have clients. Now that we better understand the difference between the client side and the server side, let's have a look at some core differences and drill down in terms of the tools and the scripting languages used on either side. Well, in the client side scripting environment, the script is run by the client or the browser software itself. And again, this is your Chrome or your Firefox and all of those kind of tools such as Edge as well. Also, the code instructs the client to make a request from the web server. So the code essentially says, hey client, I need you to request something for me on the web server. 
I'm looking for this, for example, can you go and fetch it? The processing occurs on the local machine, the user's device, and this is essentially where all the interpretation and where everything gets rendered. This is why we say on the local machine. And then lastly, scripting language for the client side include uh, languages such as HTML, CSS, as well as JavaScript. Okay, great. Now, let's move over to server-side scripting. So when it comes to server-side scripting, we are essentially referring to the web server and the kind of scripts and tools that exist on the web server for processing certain scripts. And essentially scripts are run by the server software or the back-end software. We tend to use the two words interchangeably, uh, server-side or back-end, okay, or web server and back-end. And then also the server responds to the client's request over the internet as we saw in the architecture. The server response is shaped based on the client's request. So if the user is searching for something, they'll get a different result if they're searching for something different later on. And that's why we say it's shaped by the client's request. Okay. And the server side scripting is ideal for hosting databases because your database essentially exists on your server. Okay. And scripting languages here include very popular ones such as PHP, Node.js, as well as the ever popular Python. Now, in web development, there is this term called platform utility, and this basically refers to the ability of the network to connect to various devices and different operating systems. Not just this, but when it comes to web development, we must always ensure that when we're designing content as web developers, we need to consider responsiveness and we need to consider various devices. So our content should always scale up appropriately across different platforms and different screen sizes and different devices overall so that you're not leaving one device behind now also in the event that you have purchased the toolkit i do want to remind you that your summary notes and any additional content you think might help you is all there for you so please do not feel afraid to actually use this content going forward especially when it comes to using it for your lesson assignments or your module assignments now before we call it a day with our final topic let's have a look at what's coming up in our next lesson in our next lesson we jump right into web development we'll learn more about the html markup language and we'll also install the required software so that we can begin developing our first web page using html we'll also learn about the importance of commenting and why we use it in any sort of software development process so stay tuned because it's going to be really exciting Wonderful. Now for our final topic, as promised, web languages. And in this section, we're going to be covering CSS, HTML as our markup language, and then have a look at some examples. Now, generally speaking, there are three core technologies of the web, and these are not necessarily the only three, but these are the basic three that we need to understand for now. And this includes hypertext, our styling language, as well as the graphical user interface, otherwise known as the GUI or the GUI. Now, hypertext basically describes a page linking system on the web. And if you think about it, this is how websites work, right? So one page leads to another page or links to another page. That particular page can link to several other pages. And this is why we call these kind of documents HTML documents. We also refer to them as hypertext markup language. And HTML documents are essentially the skeleton of a web page or a website. Okay, they make up the skeleton where your styling makes up the meat as well as JavaScript. And essentially, HTML documents includes a set of tags which describe the relationship among elements. Now, an element could be something like a paragraph tag, a, a div container, a button, a input form. These are all elements of the web. Okay. And tags provide formatting instructions to the client so that they are rendered correctly in our browser, for example. And then lastly, most tags have an opening and a closing tag, and this is how we stipulate them. Okay, now not all tags have an opening and closing tag, but when we get into web dev or web development, I'll show you a couple of examples. Now, here is a typical example of what an HTML document looks like. At the top, we have this thing called an HTML element. At the very bottom, we have a closing tag for that element. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this right now because when we start with web development, I want to start fresh with all of you guys, okay? And everything in between these tags is essentially the content that you're seeing being rendered in the block at the bottom that says fundamentals of business information systems. Now, remember we spoke about clients earlier. The client's job is to take all that code that you see at the top and render it out into a human readable format, okay? And this is why we have clients in web development. 
as we mentioned before styling is another very important part of web technologies and essentially when it comes to styling we use style sheets which is essentially a set of instructions given to the web to make our websites more beautiful and pretty and gives us a bit of uh i don't know what the word is i'm trying to think of it it gives us a bit more pop to our website there we go pop seems like a decent word okay so when it comes to styling the most commonly used approach is a css style sheet also known as a cascading style sheet okay and these can be included inside the html document or the code can be included inside an html document but it's not necessarily the best practice when we do web development we can also use a single style sheet to style multiple pages across our website. And this is the preferred approach when it comes to CSS style sheets, okay? And then lastly, we usually store our CSS and our JavaScript documents, for example, in a separate page, okay, you know, separate file. And we reference these documents, we reference our CSS document inside our HTML sheet or our HTML document. Now, here is a typical example of CSS code. You don't necessarily see it right off the bat, but if you look in our code over here, we have this um, style tag, okay, that says type text uh, slash CSS, okay, and then we've got the closing tag somewhere slightly at the bottom for our style or our CSS code. And this in between all of this, these two tags, this is our CSS code. This is what we use to style a website. And you'll notice the difference in our output here is that our website pops a little more. Okay, thinking I'm liking the word pop. Uh, it makes our website a little more beautiful, okay, more appealing, even though it's just a slight variation in colors, for example. This is essentially why we use CSS, to style our HTML content. Now keep in mind, we will not be using this approach where we embed CSS code in our HTML document. We will actually be using a separate file to host our CSS code. And again, that will all be shown to you as we progress through the lessons. Fantastic. We did also mention the GUI or the graphical user interface, which is a core component of web development. And essentially the GUI is the component that the user interacts with. At the bottom of the video, we've got a simple example of an e-commerce website where there's a shopping cart and a sign-in page. And we can see that the buttons have been made really beautiful. The forms have been styled slightly. There's a couple of images and all of those kind of things, okay? But the core difference here is the one of the most important things to remember here is that the GUI is made up of the HTML code as well as the CSS code. That's very, very basic. You can include JavaScript as well, but keep in mind, we are trying to just simplify things for the time being. Now let's try and conceptualize the GUI to sort of figure out why it's so important. And essentially the graphical user interface is just a way of representing a program control functions as well as the output to users and accepting input as well, which is why we use forms and buttons, okay? But apart from that, it's also the part that the user interacts with. So again, this goes back to the first point. A GUI allows users to interface with the system, like accepting information or pushing buttons or searching things, okay? Strong UX focus should always be core when it comes to development because this is going to determine whether or not a user wants to use your website. Apart from this, this also determines user acceptance when it comes to your website and users actually using your website. So a couple of things you can take into consideration is the use of pictures, icons, and other graphical elements such as elements and transitions to make your website more appealing instead of just plain bland text. Wonderful. And that brings us to the end of our very first session in web development. I would really like to encourage you to check out your course resources, especially your summary notes, because this is where I will be making the source code available to you throughout this course when we start scripting. With that being said, it's worth noting that your summary notes in combination with your web slides as well as your actual video lessons will help prepare you for your lesson quizzes. And you will be receiving a lesson quiz after every two lessons within a given module. And if you find yourself getting stuck at any point, please do feel free to contact us at support at shoeacademy.com. If it is a content specific question, I will be as quick as humanly possible in answering any queries that you might have. And that brings us to the conclusion of our first lesson in the professional diploma of web development. Now, this was a very theoretically based lesson. Moving forward, we are going to start coding in our very next lesson. So for all of that and more, I'll see you in the next lesson. Cheers.